from 1987 to 1994, I was the rector of St. Peter's Episcopal Church in Rockland. Year after year, the stewardship did very well and people were very generous. And of course, along with more uh, resources, the ministries grew. I mean, we're not here to save money. We're here to use it for ministry. But about four or five years into this, we completely hit the wall. And we asked a couple more times, if there's anybody out there, we'd be really happy to hear from you. And the money people trimmed and trimmed and trimmed. And there was still a, a gap. Now, I, I believe in a gap. I don't believe in balanced budgets. It's called a faith budget. Because I always believe that we're going to see more people as we carry on, not less. But the, it, it was more faith than I had. <laughs> so I told the congregation that this afternoon, the vestry's going to meet, and we're going to look at this, and we're going to try to, we're going to try to make sense of all this. And, and so the vestry is gathered together in my office, and it's not a cheerful event. So a knock comes to the door. And before I say any more, you need to know how my office was configured. You could stand at the door of my office, and there was a wall here, and around the wall was the rest of the room. So you could stand at the, at the door and not know that there was a room full of people over here. So I went to the door, and there's Lisa. I say, hi, Lisa. What? How can I help you? And she said, here's my pledge card. And I said, oh, Lisa, that, that's, that's for everybody else, not for you. Have you ever heard of a preacher turning out a pledge card? I said, no, no, no. And she said, no, I'm not. I, I, need to, I need to do this. Now, my hesitancy was that two years before, Lisa had come to us on Sunday afternoon when we had a soup kitchen, and she came with her two little girls, and it was December, and, and none of them had coats. We, we took them in, the, the soup kitchen people gathered around her, and, and that week took her shopping to get her a coat and her two daughters a coat. And then we noticed that, that her daughters looked like they had a, a permanent ear infection. You know, the kind of people you hug, the kind of children you hug, and you got a green stripe across your knees. Anybody know what I'm talking about? <laughs> so we, we, we took her to a doctor, and we found out if she had groceries, and a couple... Weeks later, she was with us, not at the soup kitchen alone, but she was upstairs in church. And looking at her, it looked like she had never been in church before, or certainly never an Episcopal church before. And if you're walking into an Episcopal church for the first time and you, you got to do all that, you can get a little lost. Amen? Amen. <laughs> But she, we sat, she sat with some of her friends and they did all the guidance and <clears throat> probably a, a three-year-old and a five-year-old little girl, they were all doing it together. And about two months later, uh, we baptized Lisa and her two daughters. And she had a whole congregation of sponsors. So I meet Lisa at the door. I say, no, Lisa, I'm, I'm very inclined just to kind of hand it back. And she said, you can't. And I said, why is this so important? And she said, we came here two years ago and you took us in. You got us coats, you fed us, you got us medicine. And I've learned that I'm, that God loves me. And that I'm not just a loser, failure, but 
God loves me. And knowing that has, has changed my life. Okay, I'll accept it. <laughs> and I was very moved. So I close my door and I'm thinking, I've got to go back to them. And I, I walk in and it's a very solemn room. They've heard everything. So I sit down and George, great leader, <clears throat> Says, Fred, Fred's the treasurer, Fred, give me my pledge card. Fred digs through the stack, says, here you are, George. George looks at it, shakes his head, tears it up. Said, after what I just heard, I needed to make an adjustment. And then Chris spoke, give me back my pledge card. Then Frank then Marilyn, then Ellie, and all of them. Meanwhile, the treasure is doing, the, you know, remember those things? <laughs> and we're all just watching this happen in about two minutes. And he smiles and looks up and says, we're fine. So, well, you know how people talk. I used to go to Hannaford's in order to do parish calls. In a small town, you run into a dozen people. <laughs> My kids refused to go to the store with me. I'd wear them out dead. You know, God, you know everybody. Stop it. So there I am in Hannaford's Monday afternoon, and I had three people come to me. I've heard something. What? What have you heard? We heard that something happened yesterday at the vestry meeting, and this and this and this. Is that true? I said, wow, that's true. And all of them called later that afternoon. Tear up my card. So we went from having a challenge to having a bounty in which allowed us to hire another priest. Half time right out of seminary. I don't think they're trying to get rid of me. <clears throat> at least I didn't think so at the time. I don't know. I might need to reconsider here. <laughs> On Wednesday night when we gather for class, there are about 20 of us who are here and I always, we read the lessons for the coming week and, and then I, I'll, I'll test them. I'll give them a little teaser about what I'm thinking, and I'll see if it lands anywhere. And I'll say, how's it sound? And they'll say, no, 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 go back, no. Say your prayers again. <clears throat> what were you thinking? <laughs> but all the times they'll say, no, it's going to work. So I was talking about Covenant Sunday this past Wednesday, and someone raised their hand and said, who's not here on Sundays, but here on Wednesdays, what is, why do you call it Covenant Sunday? And I said, well, thank you for asking. So I, need to let, I needed to let her know, and I'll let you know why we do this. We don't call it Pledge Card Sunday. We call it Covenant Sunday. You need to know that the word covenant is like the word contract. But it's not like the word contract, like Andy Hamilton as a lawyer would have a contract. Now, though, you do contracts, don't you, Andy? You're a lawyer. Okay. I got some lawyer friends, I do. <clears throat> There's no finer gentleman here. But the contract with God is binding for all time. It's not until you hit the grave. It's forever. And the most important covenant we just heard about in the first lesson with Moses, Moses goes to the mountain, gets the Ten Commandments, comes down, see the people worshiping the golden calf, throws down the tablets, the covenant is done, it's over, it's smashed. 
And then the people say, sorry, and God says, Moses, come up again. He goes up and gets them again and comes down and says, this is the covenant. This is the contract. And the covenant was like, I will be your God and you will be my people if and only if you live into the commandments. So how long do you think that lasted? <laughs> By the time we finished, you know, the covenant ceremony, blood getting thrown on the altar for God and blood getting thrown on them, which was to seal the covenant and it was a warning. This is what will happen to you if you break the covenant with God. How long did it last? Till coffee hour. <laughs> so, and then God gave them up to their own consequences and how well did that work? It was a nightmare. So God says, all right, I repent. I bring you back. We have a covenant-making God again and again. Said, all right, I'll forgive you one more time. Now, this time, you got to do it. Now, how long did that last? So what do you do? The dilemma is this. If sins separate us from God, what gets rid of sins so that we can be back in relationship? And there's only one thing that can clear all that away. It was understood that the only way to take care of sin and to wash away sin was blood. I think I ended with the blood of the new covenant. And so the temple was set up. And the temple was a, a sacrificing machine. If you committed certain sins, you had to sacrifice this kind of animal. And if you did those kind of sins, you had to do another kind of animal. And if you did these sins, you get a goat. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> You're a good goat, all right. And the problem with that is there was more sins than goats. <laughs> they couldn't keep they, all day long. All of them are doing this. The other thing that happens with that kind of understanding about what it means to be in relationship with God, it became mechanistic. So if I sin, all right, who cares? Who knows? Anyway, well, God knows. So I'll get, I'll, I'll get the animal and be sacrificed. And, but it didn't change their hearts. That's false worship. So many years into all this, two prophets, Ezekiel and Jeremiah, we just heard from Ezekiel, said, someday, someday, this is not working. The old covenant's not working. There'll be a new covenant. And it won't be a covenant on tablets. It'll be written on hearts. And it's going to change everything. And it was understood that the Messiah, whenever that person would come, would bring forth the new covenant. On the last night he was alive, Jesus took bread and said, every time you gather in my name and break this bread, this will be my body of the new covenant. Then took a cup of wine and said, every time you gather in my name, and by the grace of God, this will become my blood of the new covenant. And tomorrow, he says... I will spill out my blood for your sins, for the sins of everybody, for all time. That's the covenant. It's not about what we do. It's not about performance, because our performance is not really strong. <laughs> I mean, I'll review the Ten Commandments with you, see how we're doing. <laughs> I can do that. I, right. No, I, I think you're all on board. We, we, <laughs> you ever had another God? Yeah, probably. Ever had a graven image instead of God? Ever used God's name in vain? Yeah, I'm not talking about God in the D word. <laughs> ever begrudged God an hour and 15 minutes a week? Now, honoring your parents, that's complicated. <laughs> we have therapy later. <laughs> But you shall not, you shall not murder. Now, of course we don't. But Jesus says, if you've ever insulted a neighbor, then you are murdering him. Anybody ever insulted anybody? 
How about that adultery? You might not have gotten in bed with somebody, but have you ever had a moment of distraction? <laughs> and someone's giggling who's... Uh, uh, what, I, I'm not going to ask how old you are, Nancy, but anyway. <laughs> or how about uh, stolen? Ever stolen? Well, well, I've not gone into Hannaford's and stolen something, but have you ever stolen somebody else's identity? Or how about bear false witness? Have you ever gossiped? I know that's a spiritual gift for some people. <laughs> or that's the anti-spiritual gift. Or how about covet? You ever want somebody else's car? Any, I mean, you got it? We don't want that covenant. But we want the covenant where Jesus says, you're mine. And you can't stop me from loving you. We want the covenant where Jesus says, all right, you've done all this. All right, yeah, and I can name a few more for you. But you need to know that what I did for you on the cross is more important than all of that. I nullify it, and grace welcomes you home. I saw a couple people mouthing amen. All right, that, I'll take it. So what's our response? There's one. That's to believe it. and to be grateful. And so how are we grateful? We're grateful by how we live. What's that prayer, Claudia, that you all say, not only with what we proclaim with our lips, but what we will believe in our hearts that we will do what? Show forth, yeah, I've been listening. That's called integrity. That what we proclaim, we try to live, which means that when we fall short and, and act like a Butthead. <laughs> I'm trying really hard to clean this up here. <laughs> or when we have any kind of prejudice over any kind of human being, we need to repent. Because we need to live the Jesus way. And he loved everybody. Second way we do it is worship. We come here to give thanks. You know what the word Eucharist means? Thanks giving. If we call it the Mass, that means that the Mass is connected to y'all can go home now. You're dismissed. That's not the focus. I'm sorry if I'm, I don't mean to offend anybody here. We call it the Eucharist because we're here to give thanks. Third way we show thanksgiving is stewardship. Because of all that God has given to us out of thanksgiving, we give something to God's church in order that the mission and ministry of Jesus can continue. We honor all those who've been here and who have given to help get us here and we give so that what we do here, so that the new covenant can continue. It must not stop with us in this place and from this place. So you want to know what Covenant Sunday is about. So let's connect Lisa. Remember Lisa? The vestry of that church in us. Think about that pledge card. Anybody got one handy? Oh yeah, I'm not looking at it. I don't look at them. I don't. Think about this pledge card in a sacramental way. Oh, here. Yeah, we got some more. I'm, just hold on to them. I'm going to call on you in a minute. All right. The outward and visible sign of the pledge card, did Lisa's pledge card make much difference? Outwardly and visibly, no. But the inward and spiritual, that's a sacrament, an outward and spiritual gift of an inward and spiritual, inward and spiritual reality. The, the inward and spiritual reality is that she reminded us all how grateful we were. It's George. After what I just heard, I need to make an adjustment. So as you think about coming forward today, to lay that card on that altar, which is symbolic of laying your life there in thanksgiving for your life and in thanksgiving for the new covenant, remember Lisa. 
because we need to come to that altar with thanksgiving and our knees shaking a little bit and our heart wide open to the bounty of God. Amen.